Um, hello everyone, Maria Young here welcoming you from SHEP Earthaware and Green Spaces for Health, Cork Healthy Cities, Cork Chamber, the Environmental Research Institute and the Cork Environmental Forum. This is our ninth episode in the series Greening Our City and our last of this season and we will be returning in the autumn. We'll keep you informed in advance of the date of our return. In the meanwhile, we're delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Tamara Soma, all the way from Canada today. We first encountered Tamara speaking about food asset mapping at the WHO Urban Design for Health Symposium. And we were struck by not only what she had to say, but also that so much of what she said seemed very familiar and relevant to our own city of Cork. So we contacted Tamara straight away and she generously agreed to present at today's session. The local project that we wish to highlight today is called Test Site, and it's an urban ecology, architecture and art research project, which is happening at Carl's Key this summer. In brief, the project aims to engage with natural and built heritage using site specific architectural interventions, film performance work, discursive talks and live events to respond to a vacant island site in the city centre. And to tell us about this shortly is Aoife Desmond and Alva Cunningham. Our moderator today is James O'Donovan from the Cork Environmental Forum and James will formally introduce our guest speaker who will give her presentation lasting about 30 minutes or so and the session will then open up um, for questions from the audience. The questions as always will be facilitated through the chat box and you can start entering your questions as soon as the talks begin. And just so you are aware, we are recording this session today for the archives. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the talks and I hand you over now to Alva. Sorry, to Aoife. Hi, so I'm Aoife Desmond um, and this is a project that um, started as a collaboration between myself and Alva Cunningham. And just to introduce us briefly, Alva Cunningham is a an architect who's reached recently um, received her qualifications and I'm an interdisciplinary artist who works with visual art, performance and film. Um, so this project has really been initiated in response to a collection of vacant sites at Curls Quay. Um, so we responded to the emergent ecologies on site, the architectural heritage and then the potential and significance of this site within urban planning at this particular moment in Cork and the kind of potential that a site like this can have. Um, and part of, I suppose, one of the remits of the project is really that this is inclusive, that this is a collective placemaking project, that it's really an invitation to the community of Cork and wider communities to really think about an engagement with a site like this and to kind of reimagine its future as well as having a deeper knowledge and insight into its history and also what it is now and its location. Um, so we, we're actually part of a, we're now part of a wider team. So as I said, the two of us initiated it, but we, we have Courtney Dunin and Mary Kelleher working with us on project production and then a really wide range of collaborators that Alva will talk more about um, later on in the presentation. So we started this project actually early last year. Um, one of the first kind of um, important things was to negotiate access to the site through Cork City Council um, and also funding for the project and the main funding is through the uh, Arts Council through an architecture project award. Um, we have been in a way doing background work slightly up to now that it keeps building a momentum. I've been doing some site specific performances and working on a 16 millimeter film. Alva has been designing the pavilion and other um, interventions, including a quill biog that will be going on site. Um, and we're planning then a series of um, seminar talks, live music events and a film screening, which will happen on site from the 18th of July to the 14th of August. So this is kind of the point where we can really invite the public to engage with the site in a very physical way. We've had some preliminary events, which I will talk a bit about more with some walking tours. Um, there's an ongoing research group thinking alongside a river. Um, and basically we're constantly looking at ways to draw people into the site because our physical capacity will be quite limited. 
Um, so we're looking at different ways for engaging people with the ideologies behind the project, um, which is always looking at this overlap between urban planning, architectural heritage and ecology. So you can see here that it's a very significant riverside location, Curls Quay. Um, it's, the site is currently surrounded by hoarding and will be for the duration of our project. Um, it, it's a site of a very kind of interesting emergent ecology, so many plants including Bodleia, which we're well familiar with, um, and then we're including introducing some native species. Here you can just about see there's a very handsome limestone ladies toilet which is also on site. It's currently not in working order. Um, but is in very good condition and would it would be possible to restore it. Um, what you can't see here in this image, this is a still from the film and it's actually a still from the site clearance that Cork City Council did for us before so that we could start to, to work on site. So when we first encountered the site the hoarding was broken and there was piles of debris within the site. Um, what the site just behind this is the former R.H. Parker and Sons sawmill, our Cork Timber and Slate Co. And prior to that, Houghton and Co. It's had many lives as, as a timber industry, timber trading point. Um, so the sawmill has is a very significant um, site, both historically, socially and of architectural significance. And it has these really beautiful Belfast trusses, which you can see from the outside. And these have been an inspiration for the pavilion. Um, the trusses are currently um, about to be installed tomorrow on site as part of the pavilion. And they've been built by Mahamara, the community boat building yard in um, Crosses Green. Um, so again, looking at these, this overlap, the ideas on both sustainability around how you can retain existing architecture, introduce new architecture into the city, again, maintain existing ecologies, introduce new ecologies into the city and create a kind of s sustainable participatory landscape. Um, I think this is in a way, our walking tours have been a sense of us first having a physical encounter with an audience to, to, to kind of ha have a sense of testing out these ideas in person and starting to feel that we are building a community through this project, um, which obviously we're really looking forward to this um, becoming more and more tangible as the summer progresses. Um, I'm not sure what else to say now at this point. It might be time to hand it over to Alva. So as, as Aoife mentioned, we are a group engaging in participatory research and from the beginning here you can see a small COVID friendly metal of our core team of volunteers, some very young and, and some of us middle, middle and aging. So it's been a really enjoyable process to very slowly unpick the, the ecology of the site and even here in the foreground of the photograph you can see drying buddleia branches so trying to reimagine what is perceived as a vacant and empty site and really start to see what are the assets what is there and what is the potential in this collaborative or metal um, process then also mentioned the trusses so here you can see another collaboration unfolding off-site in crosses green with metal mara a community boat building yard and while Metal Mara's core team and their volunteers and the, the community who come and build together, their core focus is on the, the skills around boat building, but they have transferred that skill set and made these trusses specific for our pavilion, which will be installed tomorrow on Curls Quay. So here is a little sneak shot of the behind the scenes and all the incredibly hard work and dedication that's gone in from the Metal Mara team. So again, just showing that the strength of a community coming together, the skills and the knowledge, the history, so the architectural heritage of a site being translated into a modern day version of a Belfast truss. So bolted connections, looking at a circular economy and reimagining more sustainable ways that we can build, assemble and dissemble for the future of the city. Here you can get a little brief snippet of the post and beam structure being erected inside the hoarding on Curls Quay. So very prominent location for the Bridewell Garda station opening out onto the river edge. And as Aoife mentioned, the hoarding will remain in place for the duration of the project. But these little snippets, these views through as the, the progress of the construction stage unfolds on site 
And what we have done is we've installed little peep holes along the hoarding. You can barely glimpse one here, this little white dot in the green. But if, if you do travel along the hoarding, along Curls Quay, we're inviting people to take a peek in ahead of the public opening. So again, just trying to bring small, very subtle layers of engagement through at this stage while we make this the space um, ready for public engagement later in July. Here again, as Aoife mentioned, the first of our real formal public engagement invitations was a series of walking tours. So over the last month or three weeks, I suppose, we held six walking tours. And again, coming back to our core pillar strands of architectural heritage, biodiversity and urban planning, we walked the same parts of the city, but with people and experts, professionals of different backgrounds, and together began to learn the really intertwined or enmeshed theory and history behind the city and how it developed. And it's just beginning to give us this sense of collective or collaborative education and understanding, understanding and thought around how the city has developed, how it sits currently and what its future holds in store for it. So again, you can see here a little sneak peek through the hoarding in towards the structure that will soon open. Then coming back, I suppose, to something that Aoife briefly touched on, test site as a project would not have initially been possible without the support of the Arts Council and the architecture funding that we received from them. But then we have, in actually pursuing this project, developed a huge support network from local businesses and um, organisations. And one, I suppose, which we could mention today is the, the installation of our Quill Vyog. So we're going to install a, a temporary woodlands of 300 trees on site. And Court Chamber have actually supported us in, in realising this part of the project. So again, beginning to explore through physical space and understanding a temporary space, looking at 300 trees in this site during the summer months, but then imagining together collectively what a future version of that woodland looks like for Cork City with the community finding homes for trees and, and finding, I suppose, more natural or green spaces into the future for Cork City. Um, so then just, I suppose, to briefly wrap up, um, this is a really, I suppose, quick fire overview of what test site is, but we really welcome questions. If you'd like to know more about the project, if you'd like to volunteer during our public engagement stage or once we begin to unwind this temporary stage um, and help us with the future of test site, if you have any ideas or if you're just curious to know more about what we are beginning to imagine that the future of test site to be, then please do get in touch. Um, we have a landing page on our website at the moment and over the next few weeks that will continue to grow and it will become an online, a digital archive of everything that unfolds in person on Curls Key. We're also on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, so you'll find us at Test Site Project and you're always welcome to, to email us hello at testsitecurlskey.ie. So thank you very much um, for inviting us to speak and we really welcome any questions or thoughts you might have and really looking forward to tomorrow's presentation also. Thank so thank, thanks very much, Eva and Ailva. What I'll suggest is that um, anybody uh, as tomorrow's talk is going on as well if you think of any questions for Aoife and Elva you can put them in the chat box and then I can uh, we can uh, after tomorrow's presentation we can work our way through all the questions and um, so I'm very happy um, to have Dr. Tamara Soma with us today. Tamara is an assistant professor at the School of Resource and Environmental Management at Simon Fraser University and research director of the Food Systems Lab. Originally hailing from Indonesia, she conducts research on issues pertaining to food loss and food waste, food system planning, food access, food and spirituality, and the circular economy. Dr. Soma is a co-editor of the Rutledge, Rutledge Handbook of Food Waste and co-founder of the Interna International Food Loss and Food Waste Studies Group. A committee member of the US National Academy of Science, she has co-authored the Consensus Study and National Strategy to Reduce Consumer Food Waste. She was inspired to become an academic after hearing a saying from the Prophet Muhammad 
that the ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Tamara Soma. Hello, great, thank you so much, James. I hope you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. That's wonderful. Okay. Greetings to all of my new relations um, at Cork City from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nation in British Columbia, Canada. I am so, so grateful to have been invited by Denise and the team at the Cork Healthy Cities to speak about the importance of food system planning in promoting food secure and healthy cities. So today I will be sharing a case study from the city of Vancouver um, and to showcase the importance of food consideration from a project where citizen scientists took part in a food asset mapping project. And by the way, I, I was just so excited about the previous presentation and I can't wait to ask my own question. So I've been like thinking about that while I'm, I'm doing my presentation here. Okay, um, so the thing about food is that it brings very diverse people together. In our particular case, united to nourishing a global community of cities who seek to create food informed, food engaged, food secure, and food sovereign citizens. And I really love this quote from the late Dr. Wayne Roberts, who is my mentor. Um, and he was the former manager of the Toronto Food Policy Council. So when he used to work with and, and speak with policymakers who are very hesitant about supporting food system planning, he would always remind them. Remember, it's not really about what you can do for food. Pause and think about what food can do for you and your cities. Food is a gateway for the preservation of farmland, the environment and biodiversity. It is a gateway to invest in people and employment, and it is a gateway to bringing diverse communities together. And food is that lever for change. Oh, and yes, of course, food is also a gateway for health. And talking about health, for those involved in the Cork Healthy Cities Initiative, I would like to share this teaching from Melanie Goodchild, who is a special advisor to our lab. In Indigenous teaching, food is medicine and food is nurturing. But as we know, our current industrial food system actually weaponizes food. It contributes to poor health. It contributes to poor environment and treats some workers, including also animals, as nothing but just a commodity. But it doesn't have to be that way. And this is where my role as a food system planner comes in. And if you don't have a food system planner in, um, in Cork, in your city, I highly recommend that you do. So today in our, on our agenda, I will provide a brief overview of uh, food system planning. So what is it all about? Maybe you've never heard of it before. I will then introduce you to food asset mapping and then highlight the potential of integrating food asset mapping with citizen science. I will also introduce you to a creative research methodology called PhotoVoice, which offers a great way to integrate communities' voices and experiences. And then I will highlight key findings from my work and conclude the presentation. So just a quick intro. Um, I'm the co-founder of the Food Systems Lab at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And we, you know, so my, myself and my team, we are so passionate about conducting community-based research that is founded on the worldview that food is medicine. So in our lab, we bring diverse stakeholders from across all of the food supply chain together. And this includes creating spaces for collaboration, discussion, and networking between small scale farmers and large scale farmers, multinational retailers and small shop owners, migrant farm workers, and genomic scientists. Um, and most importantly, integrating at every step of the way, the voices and perspectives of indigenous leaders and elders. And at the lab, our team works very hard to achieve the vision of a just and sustainable food system for all. So when I started my career as a food system planner in 2010, back way yonder, uh, when planners used to ask me, and actually some still do, why would food matter in city building? And to be honest, it's quite baffling that food is still absent from many urban planning consideration in many cities, because as renowned author and architect Carolyn Steele wrote in her book, Hungry City, and that's another book that I highly recommend that you get. Um, and she said, without farmers and farming, cities would not exist. So we really owe a lot to the farmers, to the hardworking farmers who provide food for, for us and on our table. And planners Patakuchi and Kaufman, um, their seminal paper, Food, a Stranger to the Planning Field, 
highlighted the importance of food in enhancing the livability and well being of communities. So what happens when food considerations are ignored in urban planning and city building or is not properly integrated in the development of human health and settlements? Um, well, that, that, that will result in the health of the community, the environment, food security and food resiliency suffering. And food system planning can have that opportunity to address uh, the day-to-day -day food experiences of community, but is actually also key to addressing long-term resiliency and emergency planning, particularly in the case of disruptions and emergencies due to climate change and also due to the pandemic that we are experiencing right now. And as planner Susan Parham noted, um, centering food considerations in design, planning, and political economy can improve the economic and environmental resiliency as well as the conviviality of urban centers. There's not one great city in the world that doesn't have great food. You know, that food is so central to a thriving community. So again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of planners and city builders who understand the role of food in cities and understand how to engage with food as part of their toolbox to strengthen the local food system. And so I'm very excited to share with you one particular tool um, in my toolbox called food asset mapping. And I also use a method called photo voice to share the everyday food stories of diverse communities. And again, if you are interested in doing an initiative like this in Cork or a project like photo voice food asset mapping, I would be very, very happy uh, to help um, you um, realize that if you're interested. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the case study in the project, um, our home, our food, our resilience, and this is the citizen science photo voice food project. It's actually covering a very big area. So uh, Vancouver, the, so in the urban context, um, Port Alberni, which is the rural context, and then a remote context in Terrace, BC, in all of the province of British Columbia. But today I'm only going to highlight the urban case study, which is Vancouver. So the city of Vancouver, for all intent and purposes, it seems to be the ideal place for food system planning. There are thousands of food assets, numerous urban agriculture sites, many, many food champions. And from a food governance framework, the policies in the city seem to provide food security. So Vancouver has a food charter, a food strategy. The city is also a signatory to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, which sounds amazing. However, there are also massive issues around inequality, gentrification and displacement, and also very, very high living costs. In fact, Vancouver is the top 10 most expensive city in the world. So in Vancouver, one in three indigenous children live in poverty and one in five recent immigrant households face food insecurity. And this issue often impacts the most marginalized communities, particularly indigenous, racialized and new immigrant communities. So let's talk about this tool called food asset mapping. So food asset mapping is an emerging tool that is growing in popularity in various municipalities. And scholars have argued that, you know, food asset mapping can provide a baseline of a city's food asset and basically map out infrastructures that can support community food security. Most food asset maps right now are developed by policymakers, by planners, by public health practitioners, by academics, but may not be developed by community members themselves. So food assets for those who are new to the term includes a various types of infrastructure that maintain food secure communities. This can include farms, processing centers, restaurants, retailers, community gardens, community kitchens, and more. But it's important to remember that there's really no consensus around what is meant by food assets. And also the content of a food asset map really depends on who contributes to identifying and categorizing uh, of the assets. So based on who's included and who gets to define, it is possible that um, the, the food asset maps may neglect important spaces and places. For example, like informal food spaces, cultural assets, indigenous food spaces, um, spiritual assets, for example. Currently, most food asset maps that you will find will typically look like this, with little icons identifying different categories of assets. Um, and online food asset maps like this are basically wayfinding tools. So it helps users or community organizations direct people from point A to point B. Um, and just to let you know, um, you can do your own food asset. You can do uh, different types of assets, art assets, cultural assets, you name it. It's very, very easy. If you have a Google account, um, all you have to do is have like a Gmail or Google account, 
go on Google Drive, and then you will see um, on the drop down under Drive, there's actually an option called Google Google My Maps, and it's very easy. And again, I would be very happy to help if you're ever interested in doing something like this. And I I do a lot of asset mapping exercise with my students because they really really enjoy that. So there are several cautions, by the way, and limitations that should be considered when working on any type of asset map, including food asset map. First, um, the scholar named Duncan cautioned against what is called a map tyranny, where the scientific worldview of the map makers and scientists are put way higher than the worldviews of, for example, community members and, and that they're neglected. Second, it's also important to um, clearly identify underlying values before you even start doing the map. And this is why it's important that I shared my values around food as a medicine at the beginning of the presentation. And it's also important to consider power inequalities among participants. For example, who gets to have a say? Who gets to define what is a food asset and who is not? And finally, something to consider when developing a food asset map is for what purpose are you doing it for? Is it for wayfinding? Is it for context setting? Is it for placemaking? Or is it about learning the stories and experiences of others? And in this particular study, we're not as concerned about wayfinding or direction. It's really about understanding the everyday lived experiences of diverse communities. So our study addressed two main research questions. How can citizen science-led food asset mapping better identify hidden food assets and aspirations, which has thus far been relatively overlooked in mainstream food security framework or dominant food asset maps? And also the second question is, how can the integration of photo voice in a citizen science-led food asset mapping project support the development of a more just and equitable urban food policy? So we had two phases of the study. The first phase was a community food asset mapping charrette um, and focus group with 20 community members all across Vancouver. And we, during the charrette, we collaborated on identifying important food spaces in the city. Um, and then the next phase was a citizen science led photo voice study with 10 diverse community members to better understand the on the ground experiences. So in terms of the main findings that came out from the charrette phase, four key themes emerge. First, participants actually started questioning the approach to food asset mapping. They actually question, why do you use the term assets? Why assets in particular, right? And then the second is that the participants noted that the common gap of missing voices and representation. And then the third is that participants noted that community food asset mapping projects um, that have, sorry, community food assets that have been identified in food asset maps are not necessarily inclusive. So just because they're identified as a food asset, it doesn't mean that people can access them. And finally, there's also a gap, a big gap in considering the role of the natural environment or ecosystem. So when it comes to theme one of more than just asset, or one of the participants, Howard, noted how he feels really uncomfortable using the term asset because this might be viewed as treating food simply from a capitalistic approach. And he um, noted that this is based on an assignment of value. His fear of using the term asset is that whatever is not identified as an asset is therefore not considered as valuable. So he felt that you know, there might be some problems in this kind of approach. The next is around the theme of representation and who gets a voice. So participants like Amanda asked, you know, well, whose voices are really being represented and who is being invited to the table in defining food assets? In her case, she spoke about how seniors and uh, seniors' needs are often left out of the food conversation and they have very unique needs. And if, if these uh, voices are, are, are neglected or are left out, you know, that makes a difference when it comes to the kind of policies that are uh, developed. Another theme is that regardless of the many, many food assets and the abundance of food in Vancouver, the main issue is around accessibility. Food assets have been identified to be sometimes unaffordable. Um, community gardens are great, but then they're based on a plot system uh, for individuals and many have very long waiting lists. And farmers market is also a great thing, but then they might not be a welcoming space for low income community members because the food is much more expensive. And then in food banks, food banks are also considered as food asset, but then some food banks actually ask for a proof of income to obtain food and that makes it very stigmatizing. Finally, there's also this big gap in missing consideration around natural food assets. So there's a very he heavy emphasis on food assets for with the built environment. So buildings, the retailers, the restaurants, but for indigenous community members who rely on the land and traditional foods in the territory, 
um, you know, the, the urban environment and the built environment has actually resulted in a decreased ability to do things like foraging for food. Um, and increased pollution in the city has also led to the occurrence of pollution in the environment, particularly around the oceans. And so that has resulted in the lack of safe seafood. So participants in the study overall recommended that food asset mapping should recognize the value of the natural environment and ecosystem, including the land, water, and forest. So let's talk about the photo voice phase of the project. Um, as I mentioned, this is a citizen science-led research project. So citizen science research is a method where um, we rely on non-official uh, non, um, formal scientists to collect the data. And the use of photography in photo voice provides a tool for storytelling. For the citizen scientists to counter stereotypes, to empower participants in a research project, and to provide dissemination strategies to influence policymakers and key stakeholders. This is where the photography piece, you know, they have a saying that um, word, uh, sorry, photos uh, represent more than, a, anyway, this, I, I don't remember the saying exactly, but you know, the visuals are so important. It, it, it represents so much more than what just words can, can say. Someone will have to correct me on that uh, terminology. I mean, the, the saying, okay. So um, we were so, so lucky to have had the opportunity to work with such amazing citizen scientists. And in our recruitment, we were focused on inviting diverse communities from diverse backgrounds, indigenous communities, people of color, lower income, diverse gender identities, seniors, those with disabilities, former youth in care, and more. And the citizen scientists received training and honorarium to participate in this project and they were given a lot of freedom and independence to define and identify their food assets. So um, if you remember the previous map, uh, which was focused on wayfinding that I showed you with all of the different icons, this photo voice map we developed is focused on context setting. The value of the photo voice approach is that we get context, which is missing, it's often missing from the typical food asset map. It helps us understand what community members experience, their perspectives, and their aspirations for the future of food in Vancouver. So let's move on to the findings. And this is the one of the main findings that food as there are many, many barriers to accessing healthy food, um, healthy, affordable foods in Vancouver. So through photo voice, it's possible for planners and policymakers to understand, to better understand the reality of what diverse low income community members have to do to obtain food. And what we found is that despite numerous food assets in Vancouver, there are so many barriers to access healthy, affordable food. So this is a photo and quote um, store, and, and a quote from Elwood. So Elwood is a binner. Um, I don't know if you have that terminology in Cork, but a binner is someone who collects recyclable materials and then would um, would um, get uh, like refund, would get reimbursement for for all of the the cans and the bottles. So. Elwood is constantly dealing with very long lineup to access food, sometimes having to line up with 900 people just to access a basic warm meal. In these long lineups, he felt that the experience is often humiliating. And since he has various health issues, so he's an elder, he's a, he's a senior, it's very hard for him to be out in the elements with his cane waiting in line. And sometimes he would know that people would line up only to be told in the end that there's no more food. So all of that lining up for hours for nothing. For Diana, who has had to deal with food insecurity all throughout her life, here is a donation pile of food that she took a photo of. For her, accessing food banks means eating a lot of processed foods and very, very little fresh food, such as vegetables and fruits. So as Diana noted, donating food is simply not enough and food banks will providing an important uh, role in helping with food access, still the, the, the issue around um, accessible, healthy, nutritious, fresh vegetables and food um, is a major issue at the food banks that she, go to, she goes to. And for um, Mei Lang, to gain access to healthy, affordable foods, all of the participants actually noted that they rely very much on what are typically, typically called as ethnic grocer or ethnic markets and these are non-Western grocers. In terms of variety, what they mention is often these markets um, offer food that may be rejected by regular, like large retailers. So the price that they offer for community members are cheaper. 
But the problem, as I mentioned in Vancouver, is that land is very, very expensive. So many of these small non-Western grocers are being very are being squeezed by very, very high rents and urban development. And therefore, if these places are displaced, community members, particularly low com income community members, will suffer because they will lose another access to affordable fresh uh, foods, fruits and vegetables. In addition to physical health, um, access to these cultural markets are also important for a participant's cultural identity and well-being. So Manjit is a senior resident originally from India, and she noted how, you know, Persian, this Persian-run specialty food store reminds her of home and allows her to continue to practice the cooking and the cuisine that she's familiar with. And another theme is decolonization. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Canadian history, I urge that you research residential schools. I think it's um, many of the cases have been um, exposed all around the world and in the news. And in residential schools, indigenous children were forcefully taken from their families, were forbidden from speaking their indigenous language and eating their traditional foods or even practicing their sp uh, spiritual practices. They were often given foods that were inadequate and sometimes even food scraps and garbage. As such, food was used to weaponize, to harm. This is why food assets that promote decolonization is so important. And for Leona, who is indigenous, food assets like this particular space in the neighborhood is so important because it's a space for her to grow traditional indigenous food medicine. And for indigenous communities in Vancouver who often have to bear the biggest burden of unequal treatment and food insecurity, having built environment that can offer spaces for them to grow traditional food, to grow medicine, is very key to the well-being of indigenous communities and their food sovereignty. Now, the final photo that I'm going to share with you is around food assets uh, without stigma and food as commons. So planning, planning for food can help either to remove stigma or to create stigma. And for diverse community members in Vancouver, the Sikh Langar has become a very key infrastructure for food assets and a symbol of unity amidst diversity. At the Sikh temple, the Langars offer free, healthy vegetarian food seven days a week. And regardless if you are poor or if you're rich, everyone sits together to eat food. No need for proof of income. Uh, no need to share what your religion is. B basically, most of our participants um, in our project, regardless of whether they are Sikh or not, they actually frequent the langar for healthy meals. And for some of them, the langar is a key source of food sustenance. And this is an asset that might not be considered in a traditional food asset map. So these underlying values around food and culture, food and decolonization, food and home, food as a commons and food without stigma can hopefully reorient us into how we value and treat food spaces. And I hope you can see from this project how the citizens' voices and perspectives have shone through with the photo voice approach. So to conclude, um, while there is no consensus, um, some of the participants noted it might be worth revisiting some of the reframing or some of the language used around food asset. Some other reframing alternatives can include food as a relation or food as a kin. Um, and, uh, and so this is part of the indigenous worldview. And it is possible that our alternative framing may shift how we view food and treat food in general. And secondly, it is critical to engage communities that are commonly marginalized and face the burden of food poverty. And this is particularly the case in food asset mapping. And this is important because we want to make sure that their voices are heard and are not missed in developing urban food policy. And it's also important to understand the potential barriers that may be faced by residents when accessing so-called food assets, whether it be community gardens or farmers market or uh, food banks. You know, there might be blind spots that might not be understood by policymakers in terms of how people actually get to that food. It's not enough for the assets to be there, but can they actually get access to it? And furthermore, um, again, if you've never heard of photo voice before, I hope you will try it out. Photo voice, I find, is a very creative approach that can provide the context for policymakers and for academics and public health practitioners to better understand the everyday experiences, stories, and aspirations of community members as it pertains to food. And in taking this approach, it's my hope that this research can spark solutions that would support a more, a more just and sustainable food system for all.
And so that's it from me. And here's my email and my contact number and my Twitter. And I would be very, very happy to support anyone who's interested in doing a photo voice project. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Tamara. Um, so I'd invite people to put questions um, in, into the chat box. Um, I know you've done a lot of work around food waste also. Um, could you talk about what kind of successes you've had and what kind of approaches you've taken for that work in Canada and Indonesia, if it's relevant also? Well, that's a great question, James. Thank you so much. So I am so passionate about food waste um, because, you know, it's, it's part of thinking about food system as a whole, right? You know, it's not enough for us to just practice sustainable farming, but what is all of the, our effort, um, you know, to put food on the table if it's only going to be wasted. And so in terms of some of the success, I've been very excited to have contributed to a, a massive document um, in the United States to help inform the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And that was my work with the National Academy of Science. Um, and, and that's very exciting because we really try to look um, at reducing food waste from a systems approach and not just looking at incremental solutions that may help address it temporarily, but not really look at the root causes of the problem. Um, and in Indonesia, I am currently in the midst of working with the United Nations Environmental Program and all of the other UN partners to help uh, provide uh, strategies and recommendation um, to the regional government in Indonesia, because the regional government in Indonesia found that even in Indonesia, in a, in a global south, low income country, um, between 150 to 184 kilograms of food waste per capita per year is wasted. So food is wasted at that high rate. You know, and there's a massive food insecurity. So we are in the midst of developing a regional strategy with the with the with the government that um, I, I look forward to launch very very soon. Thank you. In, in Ireland, the EPA have a a stop food waste um, campaign that's trying to target lots of different groups in Ireland. And Irish people are estimated to waste about about a thousand euros worth of food per household each year. Um, now we have another question from Maria Young. How does the Food Systems Lab get city authorities involved in planning to the table to discuss how to address food issues in an urban setting? Maria, that is such a great question. And what we do when we, whenever we start a project or an idea is we engage them from the very beginning. So we would actually meet with uh, various city partners um, and, and uh, including planners. And we would actually sit at the table and actually start discussing what are some of the issues. And the fact is that there are so many um, members in the city, policymakers, who really want to make a change. But you know, at the municipal level, it's not that easy. There are various politics. There are you know other considerations, other hierarchies of government that you know kind of enable or 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 not a, uh, enable you know things to happen. But um, in general, all of our all of our projects and research include cities as partner, and so they are integrated from the beginning of ideas and conceptualization all the way to the end and even though you know some of our projects and findings are critical of what's happening in the city i mean um i think the great thing about vancouver is that there are many champions that are interested in um, in hearing the truth and i'm very sorry for the sound of the leaf blower i don't think leaf blowers should really be used but um that's what's happening in my neighborhood so it's very loud and um, I, I have one question i know recently in canada um the canadian government came up with a a, a new food guide plate and they did that solely based on the science um, and there was some criticism of it because obviously in every food system you have different lobby groups different power groups who wish to promote different things and um, could are you from a little bit on do you know so can you comment on that process that uh, has happened in Canada Yes, I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. Not, I mean, it's not my specific area of research, mm. but the, there was a lot of tension around that particular food guide. Um, and I think that one of the biggest tension um, is often also around, well, obviously about meat consumption. Um, that's a big thing. But also, um, I think that from an indigenous perspective as well, there is a big difference from the type of industrial meat production that is that is done and and traditional indigenous practices of of hunting um, and eating you know and only taking what is needed and not and not over exploit you know over exploiting um, meat consumption and so often what happens is in these types of conversation is that it be it it can sometimes feel like a one size fits all approach 
and Canada is so, so diverse. And I think this is why, you know, in my experience, it is so important to always ensure that kind of multi-sectoral, interdisciplinary uh, kind of collaboration from the very beginning. And just to make sure that everyone is kept abreast of, you know, some of the, 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 the ways that, you know, decisions are made. And in this particular case, I think a lot of Indigenous community members were felt that they were not... Um, they were you know, excluded. They're, they're, yeah, that the, their voices were not um, shining through um, as much uh, or not centered as much. And I think that's very, very important, particularly in the case where um, in, 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 in BC, which is unceded territory, it means that there was no treaty to say that, you know, we are going to use this land. It was basically, um, it's considered a stolen land, you know, um, as Indigenous um, community members would know. Thank you. So now there's one other question from Denise Cahill. Jamara, what is your view on food banks do you think they add to the problem of food waste by allowing supermarkets to overstock their shelves while gaining PR to be seen to be giving, again, mostly unhealthy food to those suffering food poverty? Does this add to the problem or does it help to resolve the issue? That is, um, that is a really very strong, um, very, very strong question. And I will say that, you know, Food, well, first of all, food banks are not all equal, are not all the same. Um, there are many different types. But in general, this idea of food bank, I, I, I think based on evidence, you know, so in Canada, food banks has been around. And oh my gosh, I really apologize for that sound in the background. I hope it's not too loud for all. We of don't you. hear it so much actually at all. Oh, okay, yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good. So um, in general, food banks has been around in Canada for 40 years, right? And so if, if this was actually something that can help solve the problem or that that helps address the problem then food banks would probably either shrink or stop being in existence or only be used for emergency reasons so disasters like pandemic you know where people suddenly massive layoffs and, and job loss that makes a lot of sense but in a very very rich country like Canada in a very rich countries like the United States it doesn't make sense that we have we continue to have this infrastructure that is addressing food insecurity only from a piecemeal solution. So I really value and respect the hardworking people that volunteer and work in the food bank to try to help community members not feel hunger. But at the same time, it needs to be a solution that also addresses the root cause of the problem and get the government to act. So Canada is a signatory to the right of food, but it's actually not implemented in practice. So it's not enough for Canada to sign and say, yes, we believe as a government in the right to food, our citizens should all have access to food. But in Canada, over 4.4 million Canadians are food insecure. Meanwhile, $49 billion worth of food is wasted. So it's just a system that needs to have reorganization. Um, so we don't have this, this constant problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now there is uh, one comment there from Aoife. Maybe Aoife, you could say a few words um, on the harvest feast for for August first, and um, maybe you could just say a few words about that. There, you just need to unmute yourself, Eva, or Elva, either of you, whichever. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I can unmute Eva there. Oh yeah. Are you as well, Aoife? Yes. Yeah, so we're we're looking at um, I suppose Eva has performed on key calendar dates or in the Celtic calendar and um, for Lunasa we're we're preparing um, and again it's it's in its early formation so it's it's yet to be seen who will bring food and and that to the table but the whole idea around the harvest and to celebrate the harvest within the urban setting I think it's really interesting tomorrow like bringing food to 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 the fore bringing it in front of people and allowing people to engage with that whole process of food production and the whole harvest how it arrives at the shelf and really helping in that education element if i don't know do you want to add, add to well, it as well? it's just maybe something we didn't mention and would be obvious for cork inhabitants but not necessarily for people not in cork is that the site's location is right next to um, the farmers market that takes place every saturday so you already have like a lot of the local organic farmers are coming right into the city centre right beside where we're located every weekend and bringing their produce so that would be enough and they've already assisted us in various ways we launched 
um, our zine that we kind of started the whole project with at the farmers market. So there's already that's part of our community that we are we're tapping into. So that would be one of the communities that we'd be kind of sharing mm -hmm. that event with. But then likewise in looking to resituate the trees, we've been reaching out to, for example, Green Spaces for Health and various other community groups in Cork who are kind of regreening the city and part of that would be community gardens and people growing food. So I suppose it's just a natural mm -hmm. kind of tying, but it is still information. Um, so, and, yeah. and maybe one, I suppose, positive of food waste to mention, not obviously the abundant waste of food, but food waste becoming compost. So the closing that circular loop that the trees that we plant, so the whole topic of biodiversity that we'll explore later in the month in July, the, the seminar discussion around biodiversity will also have a series of a small series of workshops with Neve Nigul. She's a biodiversity specialist and she's going to talk about how you care for trees, what it, what you need in healthy soil and that whole closed loop cycle that, you know, the food, the leftovers, the scraps that they become the nutrient that provides the soil to grow the next apple, let's say, or whatever it is that, that grows on the trees. So it's it's interesting that even just to reshape that idea to to move from maybe excessive waste of food and actually take scrap waste you know the leftovers from food and use them to further secure food for the future so it's, it's trying to explore that too on on our short stay on curls key thank you so there's a few few more questions now this this one is interesting like every country obviously has a different historical context Ireland also kind of has, you know, got its independence in the 20s and there was huge land redistribution, but lots of the ecosystems had been deforested by then. So this comment question from Mary Kelleher, mapping historical food assets of a city um, in the context of what was once provided within the city area could be an interesting point of research to bring to the table of planning discussions and mapping that onto the green belt as an exercise. What about that, um, uh, Tamara? Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely, and I'm just like beaming with excitement um, on this because, um, Mary, that's such an excellent question because the graduate student that's working on the his on the food asset map in Port Alberni, she did that historical context. So she, um, she actually um, had old pictures too to just kind of show the changes and then have the perspective of, so she specifically worked with farmers for the most part. Um, and so she actually had that historical context to show like what was there before, what are the changes, what are some of the hopes, you know, that farmers um, express in terms of food. And in the Canadian context, what has been lost is the food processing centers. So what we would have is we would have farmers growing food and then a lot of things going to waste because the food processing centers have all been kind of shipped away, you know, across the, the, across the border to the south. Um, and, and that's because it's, uh, it's much cheaper, for example, to process food in other parts of the world um, compared to processing it, say, locally in, 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 in British Columbia. Um, and so that historical context is so important. I, and I would highly recommend that, you know, something like this um, is done. And we also have, we don't have what's called a green belt. We have what's called an agricultural um, land reserve. And so that helps kind of uh, in a way protect some of our prime farmland, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the farmers can actually thrive and grow food there because um, it's very expensive. Again, so, you know, it's one of those issues. You can protect land, but you also need to have supporting mechanism for the farmers to continue to grow food. It's a similar thing in Europe in terms of transport. Sometimes fish caught in Scotland are, believe it or not, shipped to China for filleting and then shipped back to be sold. Um, this question from Sikanya Basu, is it possible to incorporate indigenous food systems in the urban context with all the food politics going on? How is it possible to secure the right to food for indigenous communities residing within cities? That is a, that's another great question by Sukanya. And so what's happening here in Vancouver is um, I'm part of a team that is currently supporting with the development of a, a local food action plan. And uh, this is a local food action plan in partnership with the Vancouver Park Board. And what's really exciting is that 
you know, we, we in developing this local food action plan, we really seek to center indigenous voices and the host nation, the voices of the host nation. And the one of the big thing is to first and foremost, hire more indigenous planners, indigenous policymakers. And that's something that, you know, is just slowly coming in, in Vancouver, but you know, it's taken such a long time. And so increasingly with indigenous planners, um, you know, as managers, as supervisors, as people who make decision, you know, it's it, this is one way that um, indigenous considerations can be considered. And so this is, it's starting, it's, we're not there yet, but um, I'm quite hopeful with the direction and the trajectory, so. Yeah. Thanks, Tamara. And um, so this question from Maureen Lancaster, would you please share what kind of changes in food systems, an example might arise from the citizen scientists work and their stories of their experiences? Yes, and so um, what is really important about a citizen scientist approach in a developing kind of food policy is that, you know, usually the typical planning uh, method is, you know, this kind of like um, very, um, it's like consultation, but it's only like a one sided consultation, consultation, maybe like people would like fill out some surveys, you know, uh, depending on who fills the survey, it might not be people who actually need to be represented, right? So it might be people who are wealthy, who have access to internet, who can actually fill out surveys um, and who are educated. And so in a way, um, the type of citizen science community based approach is a different way of actually bringing communities together, rather than, you know, doing the consultation methods where usually the communities that are the most burdened, you know, don't come first because they maybe are working for different jobs. Um, in, 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 our per, in our study, there are some community members who uh, are in and out homeless, who have no access to a home, right. So in our study, we actually make sure that the funding was sufficient um, and, and large enough that it would provide, you know, substantial funding for all of the community members to actually participate. And that is one way that, you know, cities are starting to realize, okay, if we really want to uh, develop policies that can help target the most marginalized, the ones that what I call equity deserving groups, um, then one, we need to actually start paying people to come in to voice their stories too. We have to stop with the typical consultation method where it's just one planner or policymaker at the front speaking to a group like a town hall kind of thing, right? It's not necessarily safe. So we do like smaller environments where community members who might be shy, who might have a lot of stigmatizing experience can like come and share their experience in a safe space. And so I help facilitate those types of conversation in the city. Thank you. Ireland has, you know, many different you know, groups as well who don't have access to power or who don't have a place at the table, you know, whether it's sometimes it's lots of immigrants, Ireland is becoming more diverse now, but also there's uh, refugees who are in what's in Ireland called direct provision centres, and in some of those centres they didn't have the right to prepare their own foods even, so there's a lot of people working on that, and Maria Young put a comment in that people can see that the Cork Food Policy Council are planning with the Cork Migrant Centre, an international garden for Cork City where migrants um, can grow food um, in solidarity with local food growers. So that's one initiative. There's one question as well from Maria. Um, are there many food growing communities in your city and how do they access land? Because you said also rents is pushing some of these um, food assets or centers for diverse food supply out and you know price of land also is is a big issue here also yes and so um what is very important so there's this a uh, plan in the city called van play van play master plan and in van play master plan which is the overall master plan that is guiding the the project that we are currently wrapping up the local food action plan is that it real it realizes that of all of the different food growing sites, the community gardens, the allotment gardens, actually some of the people that are actually using the allotment gardens, some of them actually have their own spaces. Some of them are not really food insecure at all. And so what happens is that a lot of the spaces that are much needed for community members who have no space at all, no backyards, nothing, you know, they're kind of stuck in a, in, in a backlog because people can actually use that plot garden for 20 years, 30 years, right? So, the, you know, it's very hard. The waiting list keeps on going longer and longer and longer. 
So what Van Play Master Plan said, you know, we need to actually make things more accessible. So to increase um, this, this, the areas where um, they're originally just located for plots and allotment to 50% collective growing. So what does 50% collective growing mean? It means that, for example, some of the plots and the gardens can be used for an association, for example, or an, a refugee association, or maybe uh, some uh, like a Latin American group association. And so in that sense, that plot of, of land is not just for one individual, but it's, also, it's for like community members. Um, we also suggested things like sharing. So like having one plot being shared by um, several individuals or having individuals to um, um, donate or share their surplus, right? So what happens in a lot of gardens, especially during zucchini season, is that there are so many zucchinis. And so having a mechanism where, you know, people can actually share it in, a, in, in an easier way and facilitate that is a way to increase the collective power of community gardens, because that's important, but it's just there's not enough space. So how can we, you know, increase inclusivity and access? And that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Samara. Yeah. So I have one final question. So it seemed like at the start, you outlined some of the food plans that the city of Vancouver has. So would you say that food planning is embedded in the planning process in Vancouver? And how long has the city of Vancouver had that approach where they were, were considering the food system into, integrated into their city planning system? Yeah, so I would say that Vancouver has been a, a big leader in food planning um, and it's uh, the food planning is is quite embedded when you compare it with other Canadian municipalities, for example, food planning is very much embedded in consideration. However, what is very different now from way back when, you know, from like the time of the Vancouver Food Charter, for example, in 2007, is the way in which it was done um, and also who is being included. So in the beginning, Indigenous voices were not represented at all. Um, but in 2014, Vancouver became the city of reconciliation. Oh my God, it's so loud. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, Vancouver became the city of reconciliation and that meant okay, you know, it's important to make sure that uh, Indigenous elders and, and experts and community members are centered, their voices are centered. So it's, 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 it's really a great way showcasing how we move from just supporting farmers market to the point of just supporting farmers market to actually farmers markets are great, but how can we make it more accessible for community members who may not have access to these spaces because of income, right? So like, what are some of the mechanisms? So it's really about making things more inclusive, um, which I think is a really great progression in food planning in the city. Mm -hmm. And the last question, how does this food policy work that's happening in the city local level link with the federal subsidies that go to farmers and producers? Is there alignment? Is there shared values? Is there shared conversations happening between those groups? I in Ireland, for example, a lot of our agricultural policy is dictated from Europe, the common agricultural policy, you know, so having those conversations are shifting agricultural policy in, your, in Ireland uh, is, is challenging because of that structure. I agree. And I think that there needs to be a lot more um, cross government collaboration between the federal, provincial and municipal. I would say that in BC, um, you know, agriculture needs to be better supported, um, particularly because we are living in the context of land that is much more expensive than in other parts of Canada. So farmers need to be able to thrive in that way. What I'm hopeful about is, I don't know if you heard, but Canada recently appointed um, a National Food Policy Advisory Council. So, you know, we have different municipal councils, like you have Cork Food Policy Council, we have Vancouver Food Policy Council. Now we have Canada Food Policy Council. Mm -hmm. And so this Canadian Food Policy Council um, are, are, are um, represented by various um, individuals and groups and associations all across Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And my hope in, in doing so is that they actually have, you know, people that are focused on municipal, like local level, neighborhood level work. And so I hope that that is one way to kind of like bring in that more um, systems approach rather than the silos that we usually have. So it's very new. So I don't know yet what is going to come out of it, but I am quite hopeful with the direction. That sounds, uh, that sounds like a very an excellent initiative. And um, so Tamara, um, that's the, all the questions we've had. We're really grateful for your time here. Um, and thanks to Aoife and Elva. And now I'm going to hand it back to Maria Young, who's going to wrap up uh, today's session. 
Um, thanks very much, uh, everyone. Uh, just to let people know, we're saving the chat box narrative and uh, we can email on a list of any links that were mentioned here today. And uh, just a note as well to remind everyone in the audience that uh, Cork, the Cork City Development Plan 2022 to 28 will be released soon. That's the latest iteration of it. And um, we urge people to read it carefully and consider making submissions there will be an eight week window to respond. And you might consider, in fact, after today now, the question of food planning for our city and ideas on how we might address this question for the next decade. Um, if you've any suggestions for topics uh, for future presentations or speakers, please feel free to um, contact us. Anyone you think would be beneficial for this series, Greening Our City, um, please email us at um, any of the group's emails. Uh, for example, you can email greenspacescork at gmail.com or you could email shepearthaware at gmail.com. We'd love to hear of your uh, suggestions. We've every intention of continuing this as, as long as we can. Um, I just want to say thank you now to everybody <clears throat> who contributed to the nine sessions we've had thus far. Thank you today to our moderator James O'Donovan and also to Denise Cahill from Cork Healthy Cities, to Drs Paul Bolger and Aoife Corcoran from the Environmental Research Institute, to Frank Dore and Eileen Lynch of Shep Earth Aware and Elders for Earth. Uh, we want to thank Cork Chamber. Um, a big thank you to our wonderful technical host Vicky o Connor from Cork Chamber. Thanks also, of course, to Michelle O'Sullivan, who's left Cork Chamber, but who worked with us on this series all along. A massive thank you to Dr. Tamara Soma for a wonderful talk, very inspirational, and we'll definitely be in touch, Tamara, about some of those suggestions regarding asset mapping. We'd love your help with that. Um, thank you also to Alva and Aoife, and we'll be keeping an eye on Kirill's Key over the summer, and we look forward to visiting the site. And also a big thank you to all our participants and to everyone who made this happen. We hope everyone has a lovely summer, and we look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you very much. Bye now.